Um, you've talked about acting, like starting out as an actor. Um, what do you think that has brought to to your writing, to to have that actor's perspective or that experience on stage? <sighs> that's a good question. Um, that's a good question because I. I uh, there are many things I could say about that, but I guess I, I have to preempt everything and say this is not false humility, but I actually don't feel like I'm a good actor, which is why I stopped. And uh, so all the stuff that I would have said 10 years ago that, that acting has brought to my writing feels a little false to me now, I think. Because, and that's come out directly, that's come out directly over the, the you know, as, as I do more and more shows and I encounter more and more really good actors. So really what do you think actors. that they have that, that you don't feel you had at that point? Uh, without a doubt, the thing that they have is the ability to get lost in themselves. Mm -hmm. I, and I remember when Jill would direct me as an actor, uh, and that would be her big thing with me. She would be pushing me to try to forget, forget what the play looked like, yes. forget what I looked like doing it, forget looking at the story from the outside mm -hmm. and lose myself. Right. Uh, and to be honest, to be honest. Yeah. And um, for me, uh, for me, acting always became acting. I was, I was playing, I was portraying as opposed to living and being. And when I encounter good actors, like uh, when I watch, you know, and when I watch Petrina Bromley, who I work with a lot and who's right. a collaborator of mine, when I watch Petrina truly, truly, like, and it happens very early in the process for her, um, in the rehearsal of the second or third time she's on her feet doing a scene, when I watch her physically lose her breath in a, in a moment, like she actually can't breathe and, you know, uh, she's so emotionally engaged. I've seen her do that in auditions. We auditioned for, we had to replace an actor in Oil and Water a couple of years ago. And uh, we brought Petrina in to read off the new, the new candidates, you know. Right. And uh, we knew we had the right guy when, when this actor came in, Jody Richardson came in and she, she did the audition with Jody and she, she lost her breath and started to cry. And, and it's like she was so, like that connection, there were husband and wife in that scene. And, and totally that, present, totally, totally in present, the Totally present, totally present. I was yeah. unable to do that. For me to get to a point of emotion like that as an actor uh, involved a lot of thought and a lot of real, real strained. And, and for Petrina, people like Petrina, um, it's a different skill. It's a different yeah. kind of mindset, a different talent altogether. And I recognized very, well, I wouldn't say I recognized very early on, but I eventually came to recognize that I didn't have that. Right. Um, and again, like my love of, and I would actually say now looking back on it, my love of acting was a love of, I will admit there was ego involved. I loved getting the curtain call and I yes. loved being, you know, I loved having my face on a poster and I loved all that stuff. But for me, it was also being in rehearsal all the time and being, being a part of the team that was actively putting the show together. And I still miss that as a writer. Right. Jill kind of makes fun of me now and then that, you know, I show up to rehearsal all the time, <laughs> <laughs> all the time yeah. I'm there. And part of it, uh, you know, and it's, and I, I think Jill sometimes still, I think Jill sometimes wonders if it's about, um, for me, wonders if it's about uh, a trust or an apprehension about what's actually happening in rehearsal when I'm not there, and it's so not. Right. It's so not. For me, it's about being present and, and experiencing that process because I miss it. I yes. really love seeing it happen. You know. I remember I was present when Jill said that uh, her rehearsal hall, she, she has lots of food there too. Yes, like Lots true. of food and stuff. <laughs> that has nothing to do with why I show up. So it's always like it's a, so, a real social, yeah, it's totally um, social. welcoming yeah. place. Jill yeah. always, I mean, we, you know, the company yeah. always fosters that. Like you, you, you feed people, you make them happy, you make yeah. them comfortable. Jill also has this rule in rehearsal, and it sounds really puritanical when she says it, uh, that there's no swearing in rehearsal. Oh, okay. It sounds totally puritanical and that you're very pious. And it's not about that at all. Uh, it's about, uh, it's about, and this is going to sound really flaky, but it's about the energy in the room. Right. And that there's something, you know, it's a frustrating... Decorum. Well, you know, the work is very frustrating and it's very tedious. Like the, the work right. of the company is very, uh, it's clockwork, right? It's all yeah. very uh, strictly timed and strictly choreographed. And it's, so it's very, very frustrating. It can be very, very frustrating. And that um, she's found, having done this over and over and over again, this work for 20 years now, She's found uh, that, and she's totally right because I've experienced as an actor that uh, when you swear, when you when frustration leads to a swear, it doesn't dissipate it; it right. it inflames it. Ah. You're adding fuel to that fire. Uh, you know, say, saying saying yeah. those words actually feel good, but they feel good because they're stoking it and you're giving into it, as opposed to. 
as opposed to stopping that word or actually getting halfway, going through, deep getting halfway into that word and then changing it and then yeah. turning into something funny, it dissipates, it, it flies away and you check yourself and you go, yeah, okay, no, I'm not going to give into this. I'm not going to. So it's ultimately about that, not, not some sort of pious, I, I'm offended by that word. It's just, uh, it's creating an environment within the room that is, that is constantly um, productive and respectful and, and uh, acknowledges that the work is hard and difficult and we all have to be patient with each other and, and so the last three or four productions that the company has done since Jill has really solidified her process in that kind of way have been just dreamy. It's absolutely dreamy, wonderful, delightful productions from beginning to end. Right. Knock on wood. <laughs> During this time when you were sort of meeting a lot of people that became important to your process, were there playwrights or plays that were really engaging for you that you that, that you love, like sort of maybe... Uh, other artists within this province mm -hmm. or within Canada or even internationally? Were there, was there work that really you just loved and thought, ah, I want to be able to write like this? Um, growing up in Newfoundland, uh, at, at people of my age, growing up in Newfoundland, uh, there was, I, I, in the arts, there was no way to escape the influence of Codco and, and um and WGB, wonderful grand band, uh, Tommy Sexton and Greg Malone. I mean, I still, you know, Tommy I, Tommy died before I got to meet him. I remember I, I was at a protest somewhere at Confederation Building one time, and I turned and Tommy Sexton was next to me, like, you know, as we were kind of pushing to get into the Confederation. It was some really horrible protest. And and uh, and Tommy Sexton was next to me. I was like, oh, it's Tommy Sexton. And I never actually got to meet him. And he's still this kind of shining star to me, like this impossible person to me. And every now and then I'll be talking, I'll encounter Greg on the street and I'll be talking to Greg and he'll turn into that and say, you're Greg Malone, man. Do you know who you are? <laughs> and Andy and Mary and, uh, you know, and Kathy, like uh, that whole Codco thing was really uh, super, super important um, to all of us, I think, growing up. And once I started writing plays and started um, learning more about playwriting, I went through many, many years of wanting to be, like if I could change my name and zap into his body, I would have, wanting to be Daniel McIver. Ah. I really, really wanted to be him. And he was this impossible person as well. And I remember meeting, as I started to, 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 to work more and more in Canada, outside of Newfoundland in Canada. Right. Um, and I'd meet more and more people that, you know, because I mean, he, he's from Nova Scotia. We have all these people in common. And it became this weird thing that we knew all these people in common, yet he was my hero and I never actually met him. And... Uh, and then when I finally did meet him, it was actually Alan Hawko, Republic of Doyle fame, <laughs> who was a student of, of Daniel's at the National Theatre School, uh, had uh, got, got Daniel to invite myself and him over to dinner. So I actually met Daniel for the first time in his house in Toronto when he made dinner for us. And I was terrified. I was so nervous. What is it about uh, Daniel's work that, that so attracts you? It's that, it was those one-person shows. I mean, all the work is really great, you know, right. but that, it was those one-person shows uh, and just the extraordinary... Um, you mean like House and... House and Here Lies Henry just still oh, yes. blows okay. my mind. Uh, Monster, Monster yes. cul-de-sac. We had the great privilege of uh, presenting cul-de-sac here in St. John's. I was so proud to get up. I was so proud to get up every night and introduce that show. Yeah. And to, to share with, you know, my students, because a lot of students coming out of Grenfell that we had been teaching, that I had been introducing to, to Daniel's work. Right. Um, you know, introducing students to that work that I'd grown up loving, and then getting up on stage and going, here he is, you know. <laughs> um, but that, the, the extraordinary kind of confidence of voice in that, the, just how peculiar it was, how... Um, because he's also an actor, right? He's totally an actor, and, and, you know, and, and hearing him and, and Daniel Brooks talk about how that work is developed and how it's developed through improv and stuff makes so much sense, and and how how there's such an incredible narrative to it, but it's not uh, it's not explicit narrative. It's totally character driven. It's it's about witnessing a character squirm. That work mm -hmm. is really about witnessing a character work and squirm and adjust, and um, that kind of seems to be the spirit of the work, but yet it all adds up I'm, I'm sure uh, I'm sure it all adds up because of, of Brooks's incredible dramaturgical skills it all adds up to a really satisfying story and a complete life that you get to witness on stage all of that stuff and, and I just I just thought you know in my my little 21 22 year old brain as I was starting to realize that theater could be cool right that, that was cool what he was doing is very very cool and ultimately what what came from that and that 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 continued and I think still has a thread in, in what myself and Jill do as an inspiration is the notion of uh, of this kind of bare essential theater that there's this guy up there with a table with a chair with a single chair yes. 
uh, creating this world, creating this universe. There's something incredibly uh, moving to me about that, and uh, it speaks so much to the volume of, of just good the, the value of good text and, and good performance and the actor's skill. And that's something that myself and Jill still explore. We do it with many more actors, of course. Yes, but, yeah. Um, that's something that's kind of at the heart of what we try to do is that it, uh, you're fostering, you're, you're giving a, a collection of actors um, the tools to tell a story, to, to create an, a universe, and that you, you don't give them much else but words and uh, limited set, limited props, and they create everything else with their voices and their bodies and... So Daniel, Daniel was a, a massive, massive thing for me. Uh, I eventually came to, you know, uh, I eventually, I think you, as, you know, you realize that you have your own voice and you start to, I eventually started to write stuff that was very, very different. I don't think I ever really wrote like Daniel. I mean, I, th- I tried my own one-person shows and of course they were nowhere near what he was doing. Um, but, uh, but he's also a person that, you know, has become a close friend of mine and, and, and every now and then I'll be sitting across the table from him and go, you're Daniel <laughs> I would slip into my 21-year-old self and go, wow, like you're, yes, you know. Yeah.